Hi, I'm Dan from jazzcomposerspresent.com, an online space where composers, musicians, and listeners come together to celebrate the music we love. I'm joined today by Darcy James Argue, Grammy-nominated composer and band leader and leader of the internationally acclaimed 18-piece Secret Society. Darcy is here to show us some creative ways to visualize 12-tone rows. Thanks, Dan. So when jazz composers work with 12-tone rows, I think the way we typically tend to visualize them is in a horizontal line. So let's take a look at a famous 12-tone row. This is from the Berg Violin Concerto, and this is the row that Alban Berg used. Uh, it uh, famously has a series of triads built on the open strings of the violin. So you have G, B flat, and D, a G minor triad. Uh, and then overlapping D, G flat, or F sharp, and A. Uh, so a D major triad, A, C, E, so an A minor triad. Uh, and then uh, E, A flat, or G sharp, and B, so an E major triad, and finishing off with a little fragment of the D flat major scale. So this is a row that is constructed for its tonal implications. It has these triads built into it. And uh, I think the way most people then continue to develop and visualize all the various permutations of this row is to put it into a matrix. Here is the matrix for Berg's uh, violin concerto, the row that he used there. As you can see, that original form of the row, etc., is horizontally across the top, so reading left to right. Uh, you can also read it right to left and get the retrograde form, etc. Uh, you can read it top to bottom and get the inverted form, so etc. And uh, reading it bottom to top, you get the retrograde uh, inversion. This is a good way to visualize all 48 row forms. Uh, using a matrix is something that most composers are familiar with if they work with 12 tone materials, but it's not the only way to visualize a 12 tone row. And one way that I like to use, one method that I like to use to visualize a 12 tone row is actually uh, instead of this, this grid, this 12 by 12 matrix, is putting the row into a pitch wheel. Uh, so let's take a look at what that looks like. So this pitch wheel is a different way of visualizing the row. Uh, you have the entire chromatic scale arranged in a circle, and you have the connections between the pitches illustrated with lines connecting the dots of the circle. The advantage to visualizing it in this manner is that you can see on the page smaller intervals have smaller lines, larger intervals have larger lines, and there is no beginning or ending to the row. There's no point where the row begins or ends. You can jump in at any point. So we don't have to start at G. We don't have to start at F. Uh, we can start at any point in the row. And if you look at, for instance, let's look at E. So the note E connects to the note G sharp or A flat, and it also connects to C. And from each point on the pitch wheel, you connect, each pitch connects to two other pitches in a way that allows you to go forwards and backwards within a row and perhaps see patterns within the row that aren't as obvious when it is arranged uh, horizontally or when it is arranged into a matrix. You can see just looking at this row that there are no intervals smaller than a major second because all of the lines are at least of a certain length of the major second. You can see that no two adjacent dots are connected. Uh, and that is an important property of this row. It's a row where there are only certain intervals used. The primary intervals are major thirds and minor thirds, and then there's some major seconds at the end, and no other intervals are present in this row. And that is something that accounts for the visual pattern that you see when you connect the dots. All right, so let's compare this visualization of the Berg row from the Violin Concerto to a visualization of another famous 12-tone row, this one by Milton Babbitt. It's the row that he uses in semi-simple variations, which you may be familiar with the Bad Plus cover. 
uh, right away we can see that this row has uh, a very different character than the Berg row. Um, one of the famous aspects of this row is that the first six notes of the row and the last six notes of the row are mirror images of one another. So for instance, if I play the first six notes of the row, and then I play the last six notes of the row, beginning with the last note uh, and going backwards through the row, I get this. So as you can hear, uh, the, uh, the last six pitches of the row are a uh, transposition of the first six pitches of the row uh, and placed in retrograde or reverse order. Well, that is a property of the row that you can see just by looking at the diagram. If you look at it, you can see that on that uh, very slight diagonal, the left half and the right half of the circle are mirror images of one another. This visualization also makes it easy to see which types of intervals are used in the row. You can see that there are semitones, uh, which are the shortest line, and then whole steps, uh, and minor thirds, and major thirds, and perfect fourths, and tritones. In fact, every possible interval type is used in this row, and that is something that this visualization helps us see by comparing the length of all of these lines. The length of the line corresponds to the size of the interval. Let's look at another row that may be familiar to jazz musicians. This one is Gunther Schuller's Magic Row. This is a row that he used first in his violin concerto in 1976, and then he used it in every single piece he wrote after that. He used this one row exclusively. Um, you can hear versions of this row in the music of Rand Blake um, and in Joe Lovano and in other artists who are in the Gunther Schuller extended universe. Uh, so you can see this row uh, has properties that are very helpful for constructing jazz chords. Uh, so this row sounds like this. So you can see that the last four notes of the row form an A flat 7 chord, so a dominant seventh chord. And that sonority is helpful if you are composing music that is using the row that is going to be adjacent in some way to tonality or make reference to chords that are, are used in jazz harmony. And that is indeed how Gunther Schuller used the row as a way of organizing chromaticism. So one of the the cool things about organizing the row in this way is uh, it makes it easier to dive into the row at any particular point and to loop back to the beginning of the row uh, without having to loop back to the beginning of a horizontal line. Uh, so for instance, I can jump in at F and I can see right away that F connects to E by semitone and connects to A and then I can move along that row forwards and backwards very easily. And this is, uh, I feel, a very liberating way to work with the row, um, uh, rather than biasing the beginning note and the end note of the row, it allows you to look at a 12-tone row as a series of connections between pitches rather than a, a 12 note melody that has a definite beginning and a definite end. So I find this method of visualizing a 12 tone row around a pitch circle to be extremely helpful as a composer. And it's a technique that I used in an 80 minute 12 tone piece called Real Enemies uh, that I wrote in 2015. Yeah, it is a, a piece about conspiracy theories, so of course it uses 12-tone techniques throughout. And let's take a look at the row that I used for Real Enemies. Um, so as you can see, right away this row has uh, a lot of characteristics that make it very distinct from the other rows we've looked at. Uh, I'll just play it for you now. One of the, the elements that this visualization makes obvious 
is the location of tritones. If you have a, a line that crosses through the center of the circle from A to E flat or from G to D flat, those are always going to be tritones. And so you can see that this row has also a certain amount of symmetry to it. Um, the first three notes are the same as the first three notes of the second half of the row, but the uh, other pitches are slightly different. It is not symmetrical the way the Babbitt row is. You can see that by looking at it. So let's listen to a little bit of how I put this row into practice in the first chapter of Real Enemies, chapter zero. It is called You Are Here. You're going to hear this row a number of different ways. You're going to hear it in the piano ostinato. You're going to hear it in the melody played by Ingrid Jensen on trumpet and Sam Sadigursky on clarinet. And you're going to hear it in the trombone comping figures underneath the melody. So I hope you enjoy. Let's listen to a little bit of You Are Here. So I hope you find this method of visualizing a 12-tone row as a series of connections between pitches as opposed to a horizontal or vertical row, uh, a creative way to work with 12-tone materials. It's a method I use throughout Real Enemies. I had a lot of fun with it, and I hope you do as well. Thanks for watching today's mini lesson. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Drop any questions, comments, or suggestions for future videos in the comment section down below. To watch our full length events and participate in live Q&As with our presenting artists, head over to jazzcomposerspresent.com. Thanks and we'll see you next time.